Yeah, so the, the topic today is the evolving soul of humanity. And the, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share this subject with you, but uh, hold off on questions until I open it up for questions. I'll probably have, a, you know, maybe in about a half hour, I'll open it up for you, and then we'll have some time at the end as well, if that's okay with you. So, yeah, so the, the evolving of the soul of humanity. And um, actually, that's just a part of the actual title. Um, the, the actual title that I am most fond of, and there's many titles, but the actual title is The Soul of Humanity Evolves Through World Crisis. That's the actual title, <laughs> okay? And I bring that to your attention because it's actually a really, really important concept when in looking at the evolution of human consciousness and its relationship to crisis because in this philosophy, it's understood that crisis is an essential component to evolution and that it, uh, I often say that crisis is a prelude or the front door to the largest expansions of consciousness that we could have in our lives. And I mean, if you think about it in your own individual life, if you really think back for a minute at those major periods of transition where you went through a crisis, whether it, maybe it's a financial crisis or a relationship crisis or a, a career crisis, whatever it might be, there's that understanding that often you have to go through a very, very a difficult period as a kind of prelude to the next step. Painful, difficult. You know, in the esoteric philosophy, it's got another name. It's called the burning ground, that one must walk across the burning ground to walk across hot coals as a function of transition into a higher state of consciousness. And that's the underlying premise of this talk, really, that the human consciousness evolves in that way. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about that from a variety of angles, but I'd like to talk about it both from the perspective of an individual, but also in, in respect to the whole of humanity. Because it's very interesting, in this philosophy it's understood that the whole of humanity is actually viewed as one entity, one being, one unit of consciousness in the larger sense, and that you and I as souls are simply cells of consciousness within that being. And that being is evolving. And that being has the same kind of constitution of, in its, uh, uh, its evolution as an individual human being does. Humanity as a whole has a soul but it also has a personality. It has a lower nature. And just like a human being, when you're on the path, there are times when you struggle between the higher part of oneself and the lower self. The same is absolutely true in the physics of the evolution of consciousness in the collective. And so what I'd like to do is kind of go back and forth between the individual and the collective to, to see its relevance. And um, one of the things to keep in mind is that in the human kingdom, the human kingdom, the reason why crisis is such an important factor in evolution is because it is said in the ancient literature that, it's, that life as it moves through the human kingdom is the, it's the first step where life discovers itself. Let me put it another way. Think of kingdoms of nature as just being um, um, categories of form, which is what they are. Mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, human kingdom, animal kingdom. Those are categories of forms, categories of living forms, and that life evolves from the most dense to the full enlightened. And it is said that the human kingdom is the fourth kingdom out of seven. There are, you know, you've got your, the mineral, plant, animal, human, and then there are three above that are subjective, they're subtle kingdoms. You've got the, what is the fifth kingdom is called the kingdom of the soul, the sixth kingdom is called the planetary kingdom, and the seventh kingdom is called the solar kingdom. But just the idea here is that as life gradually over millions and millions of years evolves through these categories of forms that we call kingdoms of nature. And that each kingdom of nature gives to life a certain developmental 
uh, capacity, or that is to say, each kingdom of nature, there's a, an objective that life experiences, that life develops. Uh, for instance, you know, in, a, in the sense of, let us say, uh, the plant kingdom. In the plant kingdom, there are many characteristics that are slowly being developed uh, for, as life moves through the plant kingdom. And one of those has to do with um, a sense of uh, yearning for the light of life itself, which is the, soul, the, the sun as the source of life. That, uh, that sense of, uh, to, that sense of um, yearning to a greater light, the source of life. And even now, today, you and I, as we yearn for the light of our own soul, that's the same concept. The sun within us is actually still a thing that we're striving to live with, uh, to, to, to develop deep inside. So what I'm trying to say is that characteristics that are developed in earlier kingdoms of nature have a higher octave that are, are expressed in the higher kingdom. So if this, the, uh, the plants yearning to touch, the, to reach for the sun on the human level, that manifests as our yearning to touch the sun within ourselves, the light of our own higher consciousness. I only bring that up to just emphasize the absolute importance of realizing that each kingdom of nature, certain attributes are realized by life. And the human kingdom is unique in as much as it's the first kingdom of nature where life does two things. It develops its capacity to individualize. That is to say, to really have an individual consciousness that is completely able to rise above animal instinct. And that that, that's where individual intellect arises. But on uh, another level, it's the first kingdom of nature where life begins to introspect. We begin to look inside ourselves and start to realize that in the, as you step onto the path, you actually start to realize that there's actually two aspects of oneself. You might say there are two of us in there. There's the day-to-day -day consciousness, which we would call personality or ego. But then there's this higher thing, a higher quality, a higher potential people who are on the path, really, what does the path mean? It's, it's all about striving to a higher sense of something inside you that you already know is there, and it's to aspire to it. It feels like a, something almost Christ-like in, ter in terms of being a higher kind of love. It feels like something that is a container of profound wisdom that you innately seem to hold and understand and feel. And it feels like the thing that you are to become. And that's exactly how the esoteric philosophy would say, as it look at it, that that higher part of us is the very thing that we're ultimately striving to become. But the key is that in the human kingdom, it's the discovery of a higher self. It's the discovery that we're dual. And in that comes a commitment gradually to start to strive to live from that higher part of ourselves. But the thing is, the more we, we, we commit ourselves to striving to live from that higher perspective, the more the lower self says, not so fast. <laughs> because the lower self is the part of us that has been the, the center of our day-to-day -day consciousness for countless incarnations. The lower self, what we would call personality, is called form consciousness. It represents the consciousness of our, uh, uh, it's our ident identification with our mental body, our emotional experiences, and our physical sensations. Sometimes the personality is called the threefold personality, three dimensions to it, a mental, emotional, and physical. And what is personality? It's the consciousness of, uh, that is identified with our thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations. And that has been the dominant consciousness for countless incarnations. But toward the latter phases of the human experience is where this awakening occurs. It's an awakening to a higher part of ourselves. It's always been there behind the scenes. The soul has been in the game all along, but it's been unconscious to us. To the, the primary focus of life up until this awakening has been to develop the personality, develop the ego, become effective as an ego. But when this awakening happens, 
you start to say, hey, there's something deeper here. And you start to say, I want to strive to become that. But the lower self will put up a fight. Because the lower self has been driving the car for countless incarnations, and it, it, it is not going to let go of that control easily. And that stages crisis. That stages crisis on the path. And it's a crisis between our God self and our animal self. It's a crisis between the past and the future. It's a crisis between our, our day-to-day consciousness and the higher potential that we sense deep within. And the need to figure out a way of transforming the lower so that it ultimately becomes a cooperative agent on behalf of the higher. You see, that's the function of the personality in the bigger sense. This philosophy would say that your personality is not something to be killed out. Instead, it's, it's said to be, its destiny is to be a tool, an agent of the soul, an outer garment for the soul, so that the soul can have a mental body to work through and interface with the, 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 the field of thought, an emotional body and a physical body to use as outer instruments. But the personality, for so long, has had a mind of its own, believing itself to be an independent agent. And only at a certain point in our evolution does the personality, do we wake up to this higher, higher thing within us. And the, the personality is not going to let go. It, and so that's why the path is always fraught with highs and lows. Have you noticed? <laughs> you noticed, okay? <laughs> okay. Because, you know, I, I teach around the world in many countries, and I tell my students everywhere, I always say, look, get used to the hill and valley experience. It's woven into the very fabric of human consciousness itself. Even the Buddha and the Christ must have gone through this drama, you see. You know, you strive to that higher part of you, and then, and then you plummet, you know, and... And sometimes it can happen in the same day. You've probably had those times when you've had a really deep meditation and you feel like you're right on the beam and you, your personality is saying, I'm that close to enlightenment, says the personality. <laughs> Only later to plummet into a lower level of consciousness and if it goes deep enough, you say to yourself, am I still in the animal kingdom? You know? And, and part of that is because there's this great pull between two forces. And that's that's into the fabric of human consciousness itself because we're dual. This is not an issue that happens in the higher kingdoms, the three higher kingdoms, nor is it, is it a factor in the lower kingdoms. It's in this kingdom that life discovers its own duality. It's in this kingdom where we realize that uh, we have the capacity to introspect, and through that introspection comes the discovery of our two-ness, so to speak. And that holds true with humanity as a whole. The same thing is true for humanity. You know, humanity has a soul. It always has. When we talk about Christ consciousness, cosmic Christ, we're really talking about the consciousness of humanity as a whole. And, and it has a personality. Now, one of the things to keep in mind about personality, whether collective or individual, is that personality tends to be separative in, a, in its way of perceiving and being and acting and, and, and reacting. Whereas the soul in each of us, and collectively, is unitive consciousness. It's the part of us that sees the, or feels the underlying oneness and knows that it's from that vision that action should come forth. So one of the big distinctions between our lower nature and our higher nature is the lower is separative while the higher is unitive. And that's true on the collective level as well. So what I'm, I'm submitting to all of you today is that humanity is approaching for the first time in history what we call the first initiation. And the first initiation is a very strong um, major milestone in the development of consciousness for an individual, let alone for the collective. And I want to talk a little bit about that in terms of what does that initiation really mean. Um, but I also want to set the framework in, in terms of time. 
Because you see, one of the big trigger fa triggering factors is that crisis is more likely to emerge within an individual and the collective when larger living systems are in transition. And that's what's happening today. Astrologically, we're moving from a Piscean era that lasted 2100 years, and we're moving into another astrological period, the Aquarian, and they're overlapped. And there's big debate about how big is that overlap. But, but the point is, it appears that we're about in the middle of the overlap. But what does that mean? It suggests that the, the astrological influences that are subtly, very subtly shaping human consciousness are being primarily influenced by two major streams, you might say. One is Piscean, and there's nothing wrong with Pisces. Pisces is a beautiful, sacred energy, but it's an, it's an energy that on the collective level has been a conditioning force for 2,000 years. And then we have an Aquarian impulse coming in, which is much more, um, well, quite different than, than Pisces, in as much as Aquarius is all about the group. Aquarius is about development of the higher mind. Pisces has a lot to do with the, the quality of the heart. And what we want is to bring the best of Pisces into Aquarius. That's the goal. That's the goal. It's not about dumping Pisces and going into Aquarius. It's about taking the best and the essence of Pisces and deliver it into Aquarius. And this transition is, is, an, is an energetic transition that's happening on deeper levels than just the outer world. I mean, it's ha there, there's tension in the emotional plane of humanity. There's tension between these two forces playing out on the mental plane, on the buddhic plane on the atomic plane, all the planes of consciousness. Some of you have studied those planes. If you've been studying theosophy, you would know about the seven planes. Each of them is a place where two major forces are overlapping. And we, as human beings, are simply the outer um, reflection of a great transitional conflict, you might say, that has astrological roots. But in that is the seed of what becomes the future. It's in, it's in crisis and in, the, in these tension points in human history where the greatest breakthroughs are also possible. So the astrological element of it is setting the stage for humanity as it moves into this potential first initiation opportunity. The second is rheological. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually studied the, the so-called seven rays, but they're referenced in theosophy. And, and um, it is said that we are moving from a great sixth ray age to a seventh ray age. We are moving from an age, sixth ray is called the ray of idealism and devotion. And it has a strong connection with Pisces, actually. And, we're, and the seventh ray is called the ray of ceremonial order and magic. Okay, so all, those are just words. Let's, let's use a simpler way of looking at it. We are moving from an, a, a sixth ray age, which is called the age of mystical yearning, and moving to an age which has been called the age of the practical mystic. We're moving from mysticism to practical mysticism. And that's a huge overlap too, lasting a couple, at least a couple hundred years. And we're again in the middle of that one. So now we have two understandings of the great inner tension that is playing itself out on all the planes of consciousness, we have an astrological tension feature, and we have a rheological tension that is happening. And from that, the burning ground arises. From that, we have great tension that starts to play out in the human kingdom. And if you haven't noticed, just kind of turn on the news and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's, it's pervasive. And um, it's, it triggers what's happened over the last few years, actually, has been, um, to, to me, and from an esoteric point of view, the soul of humanity is actually trying to impress more of itself into the personality of humanity. But one of the reactions that occurs from that is that shadow issues 
to use a Jungian term, shadow issues rise up in opposition to that. You know, if you think about it, in the last few years, we've seen the worst of governments, so the worst of politicians. We've seen the worst of religion. We've seen the worst of business and wrongful use of resources. And in many ways, we've probably seen the worst of ourselves. And all of that is having to do with this idea that when unity, which is the soul of humanity, impresses more of itself into the personality of humanity, it dislodges the shadow elements and forces them to the surface. It is said that love brings negativity to the surface. And that's what's happening. And that's why I'm so excited about the world crisis. I mean, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Because, you know, really, you can't really do much about it unless you see it. And so we get to see it. And now we're seeing it in a big way. And all of that's good, even though our lower selves don't like it. But actually, it's really good. Because those shadow issues in humanity have been with us all along. They, the, the business ty tycoons who are, you know, the, that 1% that seem to, as they say, be so controlling, they've always been there. The shadow elements of religion have been behind the scenes. But they're all, they're all, they've been there all along, but now they've, they're given exposure. And what's, what is the soul of humanity as it's trying to impress itself on humanity, on the lower part of us? It represents the sum total of our, our collective wisdom. The soul of humanity represents those higher principles that we around the world are starting to sense deep within. And we want to bring them into it. The principle, for instance, of, of oneness expressed through diversity. The, the absolute essential understanding that to really move humanity forward, we have to perceive a oneness, but we can only do it through an honoring of diversity. That's a real Aquarian attitude. That's a really, really important concept or archetype that the soul of humanity is trying to impress on the personality of humanity. But any kind of resisting forces to that impression will, will ex be exposed because of that. And that's what's happening today in many ways. Um, and it is the function of human evolution that that's, as I said earlier, remember that this is how it works, where as more light tries to impress itself on it, uh, on, uh, on the lower nature, the lower nature will de demonstrate its resistance. Another way of putting it is this, the more we strive toward a sensed ideal, a higher expression, aspire toward something lofty that we sense, the more we become aware of everything inside us that just seems to prevent us from getting there. <laughs> and that's the shadow. Or Christianity might call it the devil within. And esotericism often calls it the dweller on the threshold. Whatever we call it, it's there. We all have it. And, and not only do we all have it, but if you didn't think you have it, you wouldn't be here because you'd be enlightened. <laughs> In other words, the, much of the path has to do with the so-called redemption of the shadow and the transformation of it. But it causes great pain. So we are living in an incredibly interesting time. Interesting time. And, and there are... The, the potential for the future is astounding if we can get across this burning ground period. And I don't think we're quite yet at the hottest place on the coals. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Um, let's talk a little bit about what I mean by the first initiation of humanity, just to kind of get a flavor of what, what, what this is really about. Now, if I looked at an individual and described what does a first initiation really mean, it means two things. Well, all initiations have to do with a measure of how much of the soul's wisdom is being rightly expressed through the personality and how much of the personality is yielding to the soul's regime. So the whole process is all about slowly transforming the personality so it becomes a cooperative agent on behalf of the soul. That's the goal. 
enlightenment is when they're not, they, they, are, t they are totally fused and, um, that, well, that's actually the, the front door to enlightenment, to be more specific. But for most people who are seriously on the path, there's partial infusion of these two things, partial merging. And initiations are measures or milestones that are measurements of that degree of infusion. Now, the first initiation in some, there's different names for it, but one of the most common names is it's called the birth of the Christ within the heart. So what does that mean to an individual? Well, you can see just from the name, it suggests that there's something important about love at the first initiation. And that's really true. The first initiation has to do with the idea that the heart chakra itself widens enormously, enormously. And there's a sense of another place through which the Christ himself and the cosmic Christ can express through your own chakra. And that from that experience, there's a deeper understanding of what love is. So what is love in a higher sense? Love is, is to be able to sense beyond the form and sense the unitive livingness underlying the form. Love is the memory of the original condition of oneness and that it's all about moving more toward that experience of deep, subtle love because it's, that's the movement toward all things coming back into the one again. On a human level, love on that higher level that happens when the heart opens at the first initiation, it's, it's not about personal love. It's not about, oh, I love you and not you. It's much more about the love of humanity, the love of the one. It's not selective love. It's a recognition that we truly are all one, not in theory, and not, it's actually experienced. It's, it's, it's not just one in kind, but one in essence, one in essence. And that's what the first initiation is about. And from that perspective of sensing, experientially sensing the underlying oneness of humanity, comes a new attitude about how to live life. Because from that oneness comes an attitude of responsibility for the oneness and a, and a growing commitment to make a contribution in support of its upliftment, its betterment. That's what the first initiation is about. It's, it's a real movement into selfless service to uplift something beyond yourself through the capacity to sense the underlying oneness that is the greater truth of what existence is about. And the first initiation is a major um, um, milestone in that capacity. You know, it is said that at the first initiation, the disciple, quote, assumes the burden of the future, unquote. Interesting. To assume the burden of the future means to not only feel the oneness of humanity, but feel the burden of responsibility for that oneness now and in the future. And normally we're talking multi-generational considerations. See? Well, in a way, if you think about what's, what's the world trying to do right now? I mean, when you watch the BBC or uh, read the papers, I mean, really, if you look at it, in a very fundamental way, humanity is trying to figure out how to be one. But it doesn't know how to do it because it's been nationalistic and, and, and tribal or sectarian for so long. But deep down, there's a growing revelation or re recognition that if we don't find a way of being one, we don't stand a chance of survival, really, really. I think you can probably all feel that yourselves. And so what does it mean for us to it means that we have to find oneness through diversity, like I said earlier. Um, and that's, that, that, you know, for instance, one of the great obstacles today in human history is in terms of states of consciousness is nationalism and patriotism. Nationalism and patriotism are great obstacles to humanity's future. They're categories of thought. They're 
thought forms. And we, as a humanity, evolve through our relationship to thought forms. But all thought forms give us all they can and then must be let go to adopt a higher archetype, a higher uh, pattern, a, 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 a new set of understandings. Nationalism is actually holding humanity back from, from the deeper focus, which should be internationalism. It should be, it should, it's about recognizing the oneness of humanity, not the oneness of a nation. It doesn't mean that we disregard the oneness of a nation, but the truth is the whole movement is moving toward transnational boundaries to see the oneness. I remember once a great master, you know, Master Moria, Master Moria, who is said to be the head of the first Ray Asram, once said this about, uh, in, in thinking about how to make the world a better place, he, he said something to the effect that um, the, the solution to bigotry and racism is international travel. It kind of makes sense, you know. You, you go to other places of the world, you realize that person may be living a whole different lifestyle, but deep down, that's like me. That's still me, you know, that you get that feel. And um, in a certain sense, humanity is at a, is at a real crux, uh, critical point here to try to figure out how can we be one and rise above the instinctual lower tendencies that want to isolate and and be separative. Remember, the personality is governed by the urge towards separative perspective. And so when we recoil, it's usually our personality that's recoiling and becoming more protective and separative. But the, the larger trend of humanity is the other way, toward unity, toward oneness through diversity. So that's one aspect of where humanity is as it's starting to move into this incredible opportunity. The, uh, but the first, uh, the first initiation is not just about more love. It's not just about feeling and recognizing the oneness of humanity. But it is another factor, too, for an individual. An individual who takes the first initiation, it means that the soul within that person has taken dominion over the physical appetites of the physical dimension of life physical appetites. So what I'm saying is that when a person is a first degree initiate, they've come to a place in their evolution where they have another relationship to not just their physical body and its appetites, but the, the way to physically interface with the outer world. For instance, um, a person that takes the first initiation will ha develop a whole different understanding of resources and money you start to realize that, there's, that the resources that you have in your life are really not your resources, as your personality wants to call it. You may be the custodian of resources, but it means that they're to be used on behalf of the betterment of the human condition. There's also that sense of, of um, recognizing that there's a subtle difference to be alert to between want and need. And the first initiation is all about waking to, up to the fact that what we thought was need was actually well-disguised want. <laughs> and so there's a real discriminative element to consciousness that takes place at the, sec, uh, the first initiation where, where you're, a clear distinction is being made. And you're starting to commit yourself in your life to making some uplifting contribution, even though an individual may not, at, that, at the first initiation, it's not that a person has a sense of, this is my purpose. Not at all. Usually they can't, there's not a way of actually clearly knowing that at that point. But there's certainly a, a sense of spiritual destiny that's being, it, it is said that at the first initiation, the first monadic tremor is the wording, monadic tremor is felt, uh, the tremor of destiny is felt, even though it's not really grasped conceptually. Um, a person has a different relationship to their physical body. Doesn't mean that a person who's a first degree initiate no longer eats or has a sexual life, 
but it means always, when it comes to the appetites of the physical body, always there's a higher part of oneself, the indwelling observer, that has regulatory oversight over those impulses. So it doesn't mean denial, it means observer and regulation. That a higher intelligence, which is a part of yourself, has more oversight over the appetites of the flesh, so to speak. Which, by the way, translate into our appetites for, th for uh, consumption in the outer world. If you really think about it, what is humanity, what it's probably its greatest crisis is? Consumption. I mean, really, think about it. And is there something wrong with the idea that 80% of the world's resources is consumed by 20% of the world's population? I mean, doesn't that create a kind of offense for you? I don't know. Sure, that's for me. Um, and, um, you know, it's so interesting when you think about it because the Buddha said that all suffering in the world was due to desire, the tendency to want to possess and grasp. But think about it. Our Western economies are based on desire. They're based on desire. They're feeding desire. That's what the Western economies are about. We talk about economic growth. To have economic growth, you have to have something like two, what is it, three, four percent? I don't know what it is. The percentage of growth defines a healthy economy rather than sustainability. Growth is what's defined as healthy. So consumption is a huge, huge issue that our world is faced with. And that's about wrong relationship with resources. You see, the thing is this. If humanity is approaching the first initiation, as I'm posing that it is, and the first initiation means that we come into right relationship with our physical dimension of life, much more right relationship to it, and a more right relationship to resources, what you find is that the burning ground that is right in front of an initiation opportunity is going to be directly related to the very issues that that, op that initiation represents. So what is the burning ground right now? A crisis around money. A crisis around wrong distribution of resources. I mean, it's and it's global. It's global. So this is an initiation that is global. For the first time, humanity in its oneness is approaching a initiatory opportunity, and in its oneness, it has to walk across this, these hot coals that have to do with the questions of how to get into right relationship with resource through a recognition or a growing recognition of wrong relationship to resource. That's what's going on. And, and we're walking across those hot coals now. The other element of that, by the way, is, is um, having to do with resources as in Mother Nature. I mean, if, if you want to ask about what is resource, there it is, Mother Nature. And over the last few years, we've become so increasingly aware of the abuses of nature. Historically, we've believed that our role as a humanity is to sort of become master of Mother Nature rather than recognizing that we're merely constituent parts of Mother Nature. And so the whole rise of the environmental movement and its gaining momentum is a direct relationship directly related to the very first initiation that I'm talking about. Because that's resource as well. And we're walking across the hot coals. And there's no guarantee that we'll get to the other side. And so I want to talk about more a little bit about that as well. But I think this might be a good point to stop to say, or to invite any questions that you might have at this point. Is there anything you'd like to ask? After watching Cosmos, I wonder if we will make it far into Aquarius. Can we make a change individually in the CO2 emissions? Are you concerned about the future? I don't know. There's a two or three questions in there. But I mean, I think that I think we all have to do our piece, whatever it is, that helps to protect the environment. And of course, CO2 emissions are, is a big part of it. 
Um, am I, uh, was the, uh, the question is, am I optimistic about it or are you worried about, worried about it? it? <laughs> Actually, I, I would say in my own view, I see, I think that the short run, in the short run, I think we got darker days yet. In the long run, I'm very optimistic. I think humanity has proven itself over and over again over the centuries of the rise and fall of civilizations and the, the sense of, of decline and rise again that humanity is resilient and in the end we will, we will survive. But I think that um, it's just a matter of how much pain do we want to go through before we get there. And this is a very painful time. This is, this is it. Other questions? Well, I'm not uh, very encouraged about man's uh, spiritual evolution because uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And then I think you mentioned just listening to the news these days about what's going on in the world. Even from my uh, days as, as being a participant in the Vietnam War, I knew there was something really morally wrong going on. Mm. And I was just a 20-year-old corporal. And I could see that we needed to put an end to it. And I just can't understand how people, you know, in these leadership positions around the world of countries and all this military power and force cannot operate on the level of some real uh, morals as far as the use of that force and making decisions about peace and war. So. Mm. 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 Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, I mean, I think everyone in, in this room would agree with you on that, that, uh, the, the, that when we look at governments and the history of governments, particularly with war and peace, that it seems like governments do not live from a higher moral standard and that will that ever be. Um, I think it will, actually. And I think that it actually is trying to, actually. Um, and that, um, you know, uh, I know that there are people that have studied war throughout history. And if you look at the, 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 the nature of war now versus how it was 2,000 years ago, it's quite different, quite different. And um, though it's more mechanized now, the numbers of people as a percentage of the population, of the global population, is far less than it was. I mean, I remember reading a story about Alexander the Great in one day lost 50,000 people in a battle with swords. I mean, the brutality of it is just hard to fathom. Now, we lost 50,000 people in Vietnam, I believe it was something like that, but he... 60,000 in Vietnam, but Alexander the Great lost it in a day. And think of that as a percentage of world population, and you'll see that, that actually, as a percentage, war casualties are going down. Okay? Now, but things don't happen overnight. Evolution is incremental. And so I'm actually more encouraged by it. Sure, the thing is that there's always these, it's a wave pattern. It's a wave pattern. And a lot of times when we look at the world today and we see that it's falling apart, um, what's really going on is that because evolution is like this, it's, it's, it's going, there's downward trends, but it's, it's still within a, even, even a larger upward trend. So um, one of the great things that I think is the future for all of us is to look not just at humanity and say humanity as a soul and humanity as a personality, but recognize that every social institution is an entity. Politics, government is an entity. Business is an entity. What is it anyway? Business and government, those are just categories of human consciousness that are evolving within our collective. And I can say the same of education, the arts, science, religion. All of those are categories of human consciousness. But, and they are viewed as beings in a way. And that what's so important to realize is that there's a soul part of it and a personality part of it. A lot of people say the, world's, the problem of the world is government. No, the problem of the world is not government. 
a lot of the problems of the world stem from the personality nature of government, but what about the soul of government? A lot of people say, oh, the world, the biggest problem is the business world. They're the crooks. They're the problem. No, the problem with the world is not the business world. That, the, the, the lower tendencies of the business world is, is true. That's a big problem. But the soul of business is absolutely sacred and indispensable as we move into the future. So one of the, one of the things that the esoteric philosophy would say is never look at something at face value. Every, everything is dual, not just me and you that everything has a soul, a higher potential, that's struggling to work through a lower tendency. And the same is true with government. Um, and what is the instrument that makes that perspective possible? Right there, the third eye, the eye of vision. I mean, there's a lot that I could say about the eye of vision, but one of the most amazing things about the third eye, it's the organ of perception that makes it possible to see the soul hidden within form whether that's called a human form, or the form called a tree, or the form called a political system, or the form called a crisis in Iraq. You start to really look at the, you start to look at the crisis in Iraq, or the, the Crimean situation, or where, whatever the, th the thing is, these two eyes will look at it and see it at face value and, be, and either, well, well is, is often offended, and not, understandably. But when we, when we look a little deeper, what you're really seeing in world events is a set of spiritual qualities that are struggling to express themselves through societal forms and are doing it at different degrees of accuracy and distortion. And, and so, so much of the future, as I see it, is our capacity to you might say, it gives us a new understanding of that expression, working behind the scenes. It's, what is the behind the scenes? It's trying to sense what is the soul that's trying to work through this difficult, this thing that my personality doesn't like. And I think that that's, that's the story for all of us, including the military <laughs> and the government. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you'd have anything uh, special to say about the changing nature of public debate. A hundred years ago, we had newspapers, and today we have Twitter and you know Facebook and all of this stuff. And public debate is much, much different than it has been in the past, and itself subject to scrutiny and study by policymakers and government bodies. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a full question, too. So I, I guess my response to that is that the emergence of the Internet, which is really the root at, from which this is, is coming forward, actually that's an indication that the first initiation is approaching, interestingly. Um, because, without getting too technical, but the, each of these initiations is ruled by a ray, okay, these seven rays I mentioned earlier. And the seventh ray is, is very much connected to the first initiation. And the seventh ray governs the etheric body of a physical. Your etheric body, your chakra system, has a natural relationship to this thing that we're calling the seventh ray. And it is believed by many people in the esoteric community, and I'm one that agrees with this, is that the Internet is the beginnings of the manifestation of the etheric body of humanity. The entire etheric body of humanity is starting to appear as the Internet. I mean, you think about the etheric body in your system. It's a web of threads of light. It's called a web. <laughs> and it's, what is it? What's its function? It's a communication system. Your etheric body is a tremendous communication system. And it's exactly what the internet is doing. And it's distributing information in a much more efficient way than we had it otherwise. Not to say that there aren't dark elements to the web, certainly there are, but what in the world has no dark elements anyway? You know, Everything has a dark side to it. But uh, the, I think that the, the, the very fact that it's changing public discourse and communications 
is a fantastic thing. It's also helping us see the one humanity in a way we couldn't before. Because of instant communications, we can see things that, you know, I remember when my father was in World War II, you know, I remember him telling me the stories of how what was happening in Europe might not get back into the newspapers in the United States for several days or weeks. Now it's instantly. And that really helps us to see our oneness in a way we couldn't before. I think it's a great asset, great asset, personally. Do you believe that change will come through mass meditation or dream, especially mass dream coming from a deeper consciousness in the collective? Ma will the change come through mass meditation or mass dreaming? Well, I'd have to explore what the individual means by mass dreaming, but certainly uh, the increase in people meditating around the world will have a huge effect and is having a huge effect because meditation is a system that we slowly develop in each of us to start to recognize that part of us that is truly transcendent to our form nature. Every time you meditate and draw yourself deep within, you're coming to the place what we call your causal body. That's your container for your higher consciousness. And your causal body is the thing that's a cell within the consciousness of all humanity, the soul of humanity. In other words, the soul of an individual is a cell within the soul of humanity. Okay? If we meditate, we develop a greater capacity to more consciously and deliberately move our polarized consciousness to that deep, subtle place inside where you are standing in your soul nature and therefore much more participative in the higher wisdom of the collective of humanity. And the more that we do that, the more we support the intention of that soul of humanity. So the answer to his question, to me, is a, a definite yes. And again, I'd have to explore more fully what he means by collective dream. So, OK, let's, uh, let's move on and, and look at a couple other aspects to this. Because one of the things that's so interesting about this philosophy is to realize that when a cycle is ending and another one is beginning, at the end of a cycle, you always have crystallization. You know what I mean? It's a, that where things become more resistant to change. Just like a human being, you know, as you get older, you get a little bit stiffer and a little less flexible in your life. From a, from a higher perspective, it's true with these great cycles of, 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 of uh, evolution for humanity. So as an example, um, I said earlier that we are moving from a sixth ray age to a seventh ray age. Well, the sixth ray is a, it's called the ray of idealism and devotion. And it's been the underpinning energy, with Pisces helping, it's been an underpinning energy that has given rise to theology. In fact, we are told in the esoteric philosophy that all religions in the world are underpinned by the sixth ray. In other words, the sixth ray rules the world of religion. And yet that ray is, is pulling back, which is why there's a huge crisis in theology. I mean, of all the social institutions, none are in more greater crisis, I believe, than religion. And it's why, uh, you know, the, you see all world religions are in decline except for the very fundamentalist conservative branch of each of those religions. They're on the increase. And that's, that's because at the end of a cycle, the, the consciousness, human consciousness, and particularly those most sensitive to the sixth ray tendency, will become, um, there will be a faction of that, those people that will actually dig their heels in and start to sense that what's in the future is, is uncomfortable to them. And so there's a turning back to the basics. So back to the basics and a running back to a, in a very conservative movement. That's actually what's happening in the world of religion today. It's why the, the fundamentalist branch of every theology is the one that's growing. Because it's a fearful reaction to a deeper sense of what is trying to unfold and, 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 and because of the fear there's a turning back to fundamentals. And, and this, is, this is predictable. This is predictable. But with that comes what are called the glamours. 
In other words, every ray tendency, when we study these, think of a ray as a style of consciousness, that every ray will have distortions. In fact, in this philosophy, when you study the seven rays, you put as much energy into studying the distortions of the rays as you do the purity of the rays. In fact, often we sense the distortion more clearly than the purity in ourselves. Well, at the end of a cycle, the distortions, these so-called glamours, are heightened. And so you get a lot of glamours around fanatical reactions to truth, spiritual truth, uh, at the end of a sixth ray cycle. And you have also the glamour of the sort of messianic glamours, um, and also the so-called glamour of martyrdom. The glamour of martyrdom, which we see a rise in around the world, is actually a, a known predictable glamour that would occur. It's in the sixth ray realm, and sure enough, that's what we're seeing a rise in. And it's dangerous, but nonetheless, it's built into the fabric of human evolution that at the end of, the end of a sixth ray cycle, we would see more of that, you see? Now, it's not just religion, though. There's a, there's a pulling back that happens with, in all departments as well. There's a conservative movement that's happening. When I say conservative, I mean going back to the basics. A strong movement in politics, a strong movement in the arts and sciences, and all, the, all, the, all of the social institutions has a, have a backlash of going back, uh, elements of it trying to go back. You know, sometimes when I do this talk, I, or something like this talk, I talk about this burning ground and speak of how there are three groups of people in this burning ground. Uh, if we took all of humanity, we could take and divide humanity into three big sections in, in this incredibly transitional period of life. The, f the one group is the group that is sensing a new paradigm and just saying, I want to go for it. And even though they're walking across the hot coals, they think it's worth it. These are a lot of very progressive thinking people who see that even though their feet are burning, you might say, uh, just over the horizon they intuit that there's a, there's a kind of a promised land of great potential, a much better world, but we have to walk over these hot coals to get there. That's the first group. But there's a very, very large group and a growing group that they're the group that they don't sense the beauty that's just over the horizon. Or I, I, I'd like to call it a place where there's dew-laden grass and it's cool, okay? They don't sense that. It's not a statement of criticism. It's a statement simply of speaking of capacity of consciousness. That's all that is. That's all that is. And so there's a mass of people who, at this point, because humanity is pyramidal, that a mass of people who, just based upon where they are in the long journey of evolution, haven't that sense or that capacity. All they know is three things. They know that their feet are burning. They know that every step forward it seems to get hotter. And the third thing is they know that back there, their feet weren't burning. And so what would we expect with that kind of, those three questions being looked at? I mean, that would cause a great 180 degree pivot and that masses of people would begin to run the other way back to what was. So that's so predictable, absolutely predictable. And so that group is really moving back fast and strong, and more and more people are joining that group. Whether we're talking about fundamentalists in theology, like the Born Again Christian movement, or the, the jihadist movement, or the Hare Krishna movement, or we're talking about hardline conservative politics, or we're talking about going back to the basics of education. Whatever it is, there's a, pull, there's a tendency to pull back. Uh, and a lot of it's out of fear. And what happens is these two groups, because they're going in a different direction, and it actually makes those hot coals that I've been talking about even hotter. It actually makes the coals hotter. Tension is greater. 
And then the other thing, though, is that there's actually a third group, and I talk about this quite a bit in the different places I teach, and it's, it's a middle group that's right in the middle. And in the philosophy, it's called the new group of world servers. Now, who, who are the new group of world servers? They're the people that, uh, there's many definitions. But one definition is this. It represents the sum total of all human beings on the planet who have awoken to some extent to their higher nature, are sensing a higher prompting, and are wanting to strive to live from that higher prompting as best they can and make a contribution, and are doing some work at trying to transform their lower self so they can be more effective at that, whatever it is. So there's a huge hierarchy there from a, a, a sort of somebody newly awakening to their spiritual journey versus all the way up to the full enlightenment. That whole spectrum is called the new group of world servers, and they're in their millions now around the world, and their numbers are growing. They're found in every religion, every pol political party, every nation, every social strata. They stand in the middle between these two forces. And what they do is they can sense this, these people, and many of you, I suspect, would be part of that, whether you realize it or not. Most people that are part of the new group of world servers have no idea that they're internally part of a, a single group. But they intuit what's just over the horizon, just like that first group did. They sense it too. They know that's where it's got to go. That the difference between the first group and the second, sorry, the first group and the third group is that they have a different attitude toward the second group. <laughs> the first group, it says, we're going this way and looking at the people running behind them, running away, they're just saying, forget you, we're going this way. The third group says, but wait a minute, you can't forget those people. I mean, it's one humanity. Everybody is one, it's all one. The last worried pilgrim must come home. So this is a, the, the new group of world servers are very much related to the hierarchy of masters and the agenda for helping humanity move forward. They stand in the middle. They're the bridge. And their goal is to try to, to hold the vision, to hold that vision in support of the soul of humanity. But find a way of dealing with the group that's running away and trying to find a way of languaging it, influencing, shaping perspective in a, such a way that that, that group can realize that this direction is actually good for them too. And so this new group, are, they stand in the middle as a bridge between the past and the future, between unbridled, unbridled uh, progressive thinking and hastening retreat to the past. And that group is growing. And it's interesting because we're told in the esoteric literature that from the master's point of view, that group is viewed as a single entity, a single being. And that that group has a name that the masters give it. And that name is the world disciple. The world disciple, as if it's one entity. And the whole success of humanity's capacity to take this first initiation rests on their shoulders. So some of you have a kind of heavy look on your face all of a sudden. <laughs> but it really does, in a way. Because how could it otherwise? I mean, if it's going to be about one humanity crossing a threshold and two directions that humanity is going, the only group that can possibly do this is the group that's trying to stand in the middle and make the transition. And that's what a lot of this philosophy is about. In fact, the whole esoteric philosophy, in a way, is designed to help develop the consciousness of that group in the middle. How to help that group to understand the larger occult principles that can help them shape their thinking in order to be more effective in making, helping that transition take place. Um, most of the work that I do in terms of teaching around the world 
is with people that can easily fall into those, that's that category. And to try to provide a philosophic framework and an understanding of the evolution of their own consciousness in order to help them be better servants on behalf of the greater whole. Uh, and it's not just for their sake, but it's the soul of humanity's sake. I mean, think of the soul of humanity as an entity, and this is its moment, this is its time. Which means it's your time. It's your time. It's time, it's, there's no waiting any longer. This is the time to bring out the best of you, bring out the highest kind of love you can into the fabric of your day-to-day -day life, bring forth the wisdom that you sense inside that, that you know has uplifting value, and to bring it out. And if you can do that without thinking about magnitude, I, can, I have no doubt that the Christ will look upon you and smile. Keep in mind that the new group of world servers is not about getting out there to make a big difference as individuals. It's in the group that it's a big, it's an Aquarian process. Aquarius is the sign of the group. One of the things that I find of people on the path is that a lot of times there's a sense of I have a destiny. I have a sense I know I can do something good in the world and I, and I feel called to do it. That's great, that's great. But then because the personality is still in all of us, it still weaves its tentacles of influence of perception, that that personality can even distort that a little bit so that we often think that our spiritual purpose is based upon doing something big out there. But it has nothing to do with big. You see, the big difference between the personality and the soul is that the personality defines its success using quantitative measures. The soul defines its success using qualitative measures. It's not about how much, how many, how big, how often. It's about how well. It's that simple. It's about how well. You know, I, I do a lot of private counseling with people too. And I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had somebody speak to me and I'm, I'm usually using esoteric astrology as a tool to help understand their journey. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen people who say to me, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a, a destiny, I, I just know, I feel it, and, 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 and I don't exactly know what it is, but I know it's coming, it's, it's unfolding, it's going to be there, and I, I just know it, and all I know is it's going to be big. <laughs> That's what they say, it's going to be big. And I have to try to tactfully say, you do have a purpose. And just realize that the part of you that thinks it's going to be big is your personality contributing to your perception at that moment. It might be big. It might be little. Irrelevant. What counts is just be the best you can be. And, and look at every situation in your life as a place where service can be rendered. See, that's the big difference in Aquarius versus Pisces. Pisces was a very much about service, but it emphasized a specialized approach to service. It emphasized going to the place where there's greatest need, where they have the greatest human suffering. That's why Pisces in some of the ancient literature is called the sign of the saving force, the saving force, which is why, why even traditional astrologers will tell you that Pisces is the sign most associated with things like social work. Um, it govern, has a lot to do with service to the underbelly of society. Aquarius is not that way. Aquarius is, 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 is a recognition that there is no place where service cannot be rendered. That every place is a place of potential upliftment. Not just the place of desperation, but every place is. So it's a different way of understanding service. See? It doesn't negate the Piscean truth that people who are suffering need to be cared for, absolutely. But that's one of many, many expressions of service. And Aquarius, is a, to really live from a, and to help the soul of humanity as it approaches this initiation, it's important that each of us find a way of being a bit of a pioneer. 
You know, Aquarius is the sign of the pioneering spirit. Um, and be willing to be a little bit on the fringe. Because it's always on the fringe where the new paradigms are seen in any social system. You never see it in the center. The center is where the power status quo is, often conservative thinking. But the fringe is where the new paradigms are seen cresting on humanity's horizon. Be willing to be on the fringe, is my point. Be willing to, you know, I always think that if you're really on the path, if you find in your life that if there are not people in your life who scratch their head in bewilderment, there's something wrong. Really, there's something wrong. Because you should be experiencing a sense of swimming against the current of societal trend. It's called the reversal of the wheel. We often are, are swimming in another direction. You know, and, and so if, it, if you don't feel like you're swimming upstream a bit, it's probably something wrong. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, look, this is really an important time. I mean, we don't know the exact timing of when the first initiation could happen. Even if it does, we don't even know if it will. The, the point is the stage is set. The circumstances are are shaping themselves perfectly. Every, the major world crisis is today perfectly fit collectively what in this philosophy we've long understood the first initiation to represent. And what more likely a time for such a monumental transition than a time when larger living systems are going through a big transition? It all makes sense. And that you and I, and millions of other people, all have a key role to play in that. There's a lot resting on our shoulders. But remember, again, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. So we just have a few more minutes, and I'm open to any other questions you might have. Many other people will ask the same question, being here in the Theosophical Society. What do you think would be the role of an organization of this magnitude uh, going forward? Um, oftentimes, I think that uh, organizations like these are not needed anymore, but more of a great collective work. But on, on the other side of me, they say, well, perhaps this is a perfect timing for an organization like this, mm -hmm. of, of the nature of the Theosophical Society. It seems like a more and more all organizations, even though they call differently, are taking more of a theosophical uh, uh, perspective. Mm. So oh, what is your vision about the theosophical society? What would be our next step? Not going to the 1800s, but moving forward. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The expansion part rather than the contraction. Right. Okay. It's a great question. Well, I think that... Um, what I can share with you about that is what I'd also say about the, the Lucius Trust, which is also um, deeply connected to this work, having to do with an, an anthroposophy. So it's not just theosophy, but the, those are three organizations that I think are really pivotal. And I think that they're actually essential in the future. But all of them think, re realize that theosophy, there's theosophy as the foundational set of ideas, and then there's theosophy as its manifestation in form. Now, it's been in manifestation since the late 1800s, and the challenge of theosophy is that its form, it's important that the form no longer hinder its next step. It's not the essence. The essence is true for eternity. The principle underlying theosophy is forever because it's, as, as the introduction was given to us earlier, that, that um, it's non-denominational. It's actually showing that there's truth in all religions. I think it's that the key of the future is to realize that no religion has found the truth, but all religions have found a piece of it. And theosophy, in a way, is, a, is, a, is an organization or organism in humanity that has tried to sound that note. 
But the challenge, and it's not just here but elsewhere, is realize that organizations are entities that, um, that can become overly crystallized as well. And sometimes I use this idea that that which is your temple today will become your prison tomorrow. The container that holds your wisdom and use, as long as it feeds you and enriches you, great. But eventually, it's got to be morphed into its next rendition. And yet there's a fear of changing the form because there's the habit of the old. And although I don't know enough about theosophy as an organization to say with certainty my sense of it is that it may have a tendency to be locked into the habits of the old because all organizations tend to do that. It's not just theosophy. Political parties do it all the time. Just, kind of, again, watch the news. You know, the, the, so, so the hope is that theosophy will go through this transition, this crisis period, and carry its essence into the future, but alter the form a bit so that it can actually more, be more readily available to a larger audience, a larger population than its current form. And I would say that of the the Lucius Trust, the, the, that's the whole organization through which the Alice Bailey work came through, um, and also Anthroposophy. So, yeah. Let's see if I can phrase this right. Um, it's a question of discernment. I hear you speaking that you are able to watch the news and immerse yourself in you know what's going on in the world. Um, but oftentimes when I'm you know, watching the news, my, my thought, my emotion, it seems to plug into that emotional, um, almost in a negative kind of momentum, almost like I'm joining the pack mm -hmm. in a sense. And so I realize that you need to be in the world, that you need to understand it so that you can, you can function in it and have compassion. But at the same time, there's that discernment question of, you know, how much do I do that and how much do I avoid so that I don't get sucked into that. So could you speak a little bit about maybe, you know, how it is that you're able to, you know, keep your mind on the higher self uh, while plugging into all this you know, commercialism and, and uh, you know, world troubles? Mm. Okay. Okay, well, first let me, let me clarify something. I, I never once said that I was able to do it all the time. <laughs> so, so if I were, then I'd be a master. So just, it's all relative to it. I mean, uh, there, it's easy to get caught into the, just immersion into the lower too. See, the whole path in a way is a path of realizing that you have these three instruments, mental, emotional, and physical, that are going to be reactive to stimuli from the outer world in your case, in your discussion, watching the news, it, you spoke of the emotional becoming part of it connection. That's fun one of the functions of your instrumentation, and that's all it is. Your lower self is just a threefold instrument. That's its purpose, it, to be used by the soul. But we have to, in a way, the whole path is to realize how to use the instrument and not be used by the instrument how to have feeling, have emotion, and, and not be had by emotion. And that requires a sense of detachment from your instruments without repression. So in this philosophy, the whole path has nothing to do with repressing feelings, physical impulses, none of that. It has to do with having a part of you pull back and observe your emotions while you're having them. And notice the reactions that your emotions have to outside stimuli, but not be captured by them. And, it, and for many of us, it's kind of, I'm caught, I pull myself back. I'm there, I'm in it, what am I thinking, what am I doing, what am I feeling? Boom, I'm back into it, what am I thinking, what am I, you say this is back and forth thing. And that back and forth thing of getting lost in it and then pulling yourself back to become the observer is actually a good thing because in the process, it's slowly building a muscle of consciousness and it's helping you to realize that you can be in two places 
you can, there's a place to be that's immersed, and there's another place to be that can be observing the phenomena of it. Now, eventually, you're able to start to realize that you can actually start to get a sense of what it means to be in two places at one time, to be engaged emotionally and have another part of you always back here going, interesting, see? And when you can do that all the time under any conditions, no matter what happens, that's when they call you master, okay? And the initiations are all about a measure of how able a person is to do that. And the second initiation, which we haven't talked about today, but the second initiation is when an individual is able to hold that detachment from the emotional body in such a way that the soul is now victorious over the independent tendencies of the emotional body, but without any repression. So don't feel alone when you get captured by it. Just realize that the moment you realize you're captured, pull away and observe. And in time, you, you get to learn that there's two places to be. Actually, and that's the big story anyway, it's all about learning how to be in a place of expansiveness and be right here, to, be, to sense the universal and live in the particular, to be in a place of utter formlessness and at the same time engaged in form. That, that's the paradox of what it means to be a master, and, and we're all kind of masters in the making. So for a long time, it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with measures of capacity and measures of um, skill at separating. But then eventually it's, it's uh, to, be, to be the beingness behind the form and use the instruments completely. Uh, the old saying is, um, I love this, this is a, one of my favorite phrases and it's paraphrased, but a, a great master once said this, Always remember, you are the director on the stool. Never leave the stool to become one of the characters on the stage. <laughs>